Hello and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on my playlist, Dining with the Damned, where we discuss criminals who have been sentenced to die. We talk about their lives and their crimes and how they ended up on death row, and then I show you and taste their last meal. I'm Stacy Lee, let's begin. Sometimes when I begin researching these cases, these last meal execution cases, I'm shocked that I've never heard about the person I'm researching because they have, in fact, committed horrible crimes. What I've learned is that there are simply so many people who do terrible things, we just don't hear about many of them. There's always someone who has maybe done something even worse, or maybe that guy is better looking so he gets more media attention, or he does something particularly strange so we hear about him. There are reasons, but yes, I'm always shocked to learn that there is a guy that after years of true crime obsession I've never heard about, and that he's done unthinkable things. Enter Carol Chessman. Carol Whittier Chessman was born on May 27, 1921 in St. Joseph, Michigan to Cyril Whittier and Hallie Lillian Chessman. He was raised to be devoutly Baptist and his parents spent a lot of time not only in church, but preaching the Bible and studying the Bible. Carol was an only child, but his parents seemed to have been somewhat of an enigma to him. His father became very depressed because he had a terrible time holding a job. He was fired time and again for a variety of reasons and was just simply a failure. His father was hospitalized twice for attempting to take himself out. And then in 1929, Carol's mother was in a very serious car accident and was paralyzed. This placed even more financial and emotional strain on both Carol and his father. And there was a lot of tension in the home. Even in cases where we don't see maybe the child abuse that we do with a lot of serial killers, it always amazes me how often we see trouble in the home as a child. Those formative years as a child with the parents that are supposed to love and protect you, that relationship and what happens in those few years, it, it, it sets the course for your life. Carol Chessman was a sickly young boy. He was small and frail and he had severe asthma. He contracted encephalitis and he later claimed that he was so sick that that illness changed his personality somehow. He did eventually recover and when he did, he began acting out. He rebelled against his very strict Baptist upbringing and began committing petty crimes like shoplifting and car theft. He said the reason he began shoplifting is because the family needed food and household items, his mother being unable to work and his father being an abject failure at providing for the family. In 1937, Carol was caught stealing a car and was sent away to Preston School of Industry, which was a reform school in Northern California. He was there for about a year, and as soon as he was released, he went right back to stealing cars. He was caught again and was then sent to the Los Angeles County Road Camp, which was kind of a reformatory slash work camp for wayward kids. When he got out of there, he joined a gang, and with that gang started doing strong-arm robberies, some of which even involved shootouts with the police. During this time, he met a group of boys, a gang, that called themselves the Boy Bandit Gang. <laughs> that kind of sounds like a cartoon, or like a duo of DJs in a club. <laughs> it, 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 it's not a very threatening name. <laughs> Carol rose through the ranks of the Boy Bandit Gang and was soon its leader. In April of 1941, Carroll was arrested for several robberies, one of which involved shooting at the police. He was convicted and sent to San Quentin State Prison and then transferred to the California Institution for Men in Chino. Not long after he was transferred there, he escaped from that prison and was on the run for a month, but was then recaptured and sent back. Carroll was then put on trial for an additional robbery charge and was sentenced to five years to life for that crime. However, those sentences didn't mean what they do now. He spent a few years at Folsom State Prison and was released in 1947. Carroll moved to Glendale, California and continued his life of crime. Not long after his release, Carroll Chessman and a friend of his robbed a haberdashery. I love that word, haberdashery. It's a shop that sold um, I would call them sewing notions, buttons, threads, um, patterns, things that you need to make clothes. This haberdashery was in Pasadena and Carol held it up with a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Just a week or so later, he was driving a stolen 1946 Ford Coupe. He pulled up to a couple at a red light, jumped out of his car and held a pistol to the couple, telling them to give him all their cash and jewelry. 
A few hours later, he robbed another couple in the same manner near the Rose Bowl. Both of these couples called the police, and when asked to give a description, the police realized they were looking for the same perpetrator. The same man had committed not only those two car holdups, but several store burglaries nearby. Carol Chessman has a long face with thick eyebrows and kind of a pompadour, someone that might be easier to describe than other people. And this helped the police recognize that they had a serial offender committing these crimes. They reported the robberies to the media and the press began calling Carol the Red Light Bandit. On January 19th, the Red Light Bandit struck again. A couple was parked sitting on a hill in West Pasadena when Carol Chessman approached them with a gun. The woman in the car, Regina Johnson, was forced to perform an act on the robber, who then took the couple's cash and jewelry and fled. Three days later, a couple driving home from a church dance pulled over on Mulholland Drive. As they were parked there, a man appeared out of the bushes, opened the passenger door, and dragged the 17-year-old girl, Mary Alice Meza, from the car. He dragged her to his vehicle, and then the boy she had been with took off leaving Mary with this maniac. Really? You talk about a cowardly act. Wow. As the boyfriend drove off, Carol Chessman followed him and tried to force him off the road, but the boyfriend got away. So Carol drives poor Mary to a secluded area and SA'd her there for over an hour. He did really awful things to her. Thankfully, he let Mary go and she went straight to the police and gave them a description. They knew it had again been the man they were calling the red light bandit. Mary had also given the police a description of Carol Chessman's car, and that was very helpful to the police. Now they knew that this 1946 Ford Coupe was involved in all these crimes. The day after Mary's abduction and assault, police in North Hollywood attempted to stop a car that matched the car Carol drove. They were alerted to the car because a nearby shop owner, a clothing store owner in Redondo Beach, had called them that morning saying they had been robbed by a man in a Ford Coupe. Carol Chessman was a menace. He was just out in the streets committing crime after crime, day after day. When the police tried to pull him over, Carol ran and a high-speed chase ensued. The police were able to pull the car over and dragged out Carol and his accomplice, David Knowles. They took both men to the police station where they were interrogated for 72 hours. Carol Chessman would later claim that he was beaten and tortured during that interrogation, but he did eventually confess to being the red light bandit. They brought in the robbery victims from the parked car incidents and all of them identified Carol Chessman as their attacker. I don't think we'll ever really know how many people were beaten and abused in police custody because that was a very common practice back then. But the fact that they brought in multiple victims, a lot of people that had been attacked by Carol Chessman and they all pointed to him, you know, yeah. In January of 1948, Carol Chessman was indicted on 18 counts of robbery, kidnapping, and the word that I'm not even allowed to bleep out here anymore because apparently it's not a real crime. In May of 1948, Carol Chessman was convicted on 17 of the 18 counts with which he was charged and he was sentenced to death. Now, this is surprising, right? We don't hear about people being sentenced to death unless they have committed a murder, but it does happen. Because of this unusual application of the death penalty, Carol Chessman's legal representatives felt they had a strong case to get his death sentence overturned. Carol was sentenced to death based on what was known as the Little Lindbergh Law put into effect after the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. This law allowed for any act of kidnapping to be charged and considered as a capital offense. When Carol Chessman dragged Regina Johnson from the car she was in to his car, even though it was only about 22 feet, that constituted kidnapping and made him eligible for the application of the Little Lindbergh Law. The court ruled that this was not only a kidnapping, but a kidnapping that involved grievous bodily harm and SA, so it most definitely qualified as a crime punishable by death. How do you feel about that? I, I don't know how I feel about the death penalty um, for anything but murder, I'll be honest with you. I'm on the fence about the death penalty anyways. As I've said many times before, it does not deter crime. 
It costs us more to execute someone than to let them sit in jail. And a lot of times the death penalty does nothing but continually punish the families of the person that has done something terrible to someone they love because they have to keep going back to parole hearings. They have to keep going to trials. They have to keep going to appeals. So the death penalty system, in my opinion, if we're gonna keep it, it needs to be completely revamped. But I don't think you would see this happen today. I don't think you'd see somebody get the death penalty for assault, for kidnapping. I, I just don't think it'd happen. I know a lot of these old laws are still on the books, but judges simply do not enforce them. Carol Chessman claimed his innocence from the beginning. He said that he was not the actual perpetrator and claimed that his confession was coerced by the police, who had beaten him badly. For 12 years, Carol filed appeal after appeal, acting as his own attorney, and he was actually pretty successful. Eight times he filed paperwork that stopped his execution. He argued that the Little Lindbergh Law was unconstitutional. He argued that he was forced to go to trial unprepared. He argued that his confession was obtained by force and intimidation. And he did have some success for a while. As Carol Chessman sat on death row going through the appeals process, he wrote letters and essays and even four books. Those books included Cell 2455 Death Row, Trial by Ordeal, The Face of Justice, and The Kid Was a Killer. All of those books became bestsellers. He sold the rights to Cell 2455 Death Row to Columbia Pictures, and in 1955, that company made a film of the same name starring William Campbell as Carol Chessman. The publicity that Carol Chessman got when he wrote these successful books also helped with his appeals process. Carol's story reached not only the nation, but the world. President Eisenhower was scheduled to visit South America, where people had been protesting Carol's execution, and the anti-American sentiment was so strong there that they worried it might cause problems during the president's visit. Carol had a lot of support and a lot of people who felt he had been wronged and did not deserve to die for his crimes. But finally, after all of his appeals ran out and all of the requests for commutation were denied, Carol Chessman was set to be executed for the last time. On May 2, 1960, at 38 years of age, Carol Chessman was moved from his cell on death row to the death watch cell at San Quentin. He requested and was given a last meal, which of course I'm going to show you, and he was taken to the death chamber. He was strapped into the gas chamber and the executioner prepared to release the poison. Depending on who you ask, there is a story about how a call came into the death chamber just after that poison gas was released, and those who believe this story will tell you that that call was a last minute attempt by a California Supreme Court justice to implement a stay. The story goes that the call was delayed because a court secretary misdialed the prison switchboard's number. But it didn't matter because the execution had already begun. As the gas dropped into the chamber, he nodded for a few seconds and then he stopped. Carol Chessman was pronounced dead and he was cremated. He wanted his ashes to be interred with his parents at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, but the cemetery refused them based on, quote, moral grounds. The ashes were then buried at Mount Tamalpais Cemetery until 1974, when they were removed by his attorney and scattered off the coast of Santa Cruz Island. Carol Chessman has been memorialized in book and TV and film. The TV show Dragnet did an episode entitled The Red Light Bandit in 1949. Neil Diamond mentions Carol in his 1970 song, Done Too Soon, and in 1977, Alan Alda played Carol Chessman in NBC's television movie, Kill Me If You Can. Al Hoffman and Dick Manning wrote a song called The Ballad of Carol Chessman, and country star Merle Haggard said in a 1995 interview that when he was in prison with Carol Chessman, Watching Carol prepare for his execution set Merle straight and convinced him to change his criminal ways. No one can ever say that Carol Chessman didn't fight to stay alive. He practically trained himself to be an attorney and he fought for more than a decade, but in the end, as it usually does, the law won. So what did Carol Chessman request and receive for his last meal? I'm gonna show you. Carol Chessman had a huge meal before he was executed. He had a huge breakfast. He requested and received an omelet with lots of bacon, 
French toast with maple syrup, bran flakes with milk, toast, which I find very odd considering he's already eating French toast. That is bread upon bread. Fruit compote, which is a very old dish that we don't eat anymore. It's basically fruit cooked down with sugar and spices. I made berry compote every day for two years while my restaurant was open, and I served it with homemade deep fried donuts. We called them sugar fried donuts, and they came with berry compote and pastry cream, and I could not keep those things in the restaurant. There were weekend nights where we would go through almost 100 orders of donuts. So I kind of made what I would make for my donuts, but I added some spices. He requested a Coke and a glass of milk. Let's taste it. I'm not a big lover of omelets. I don't really care for the texture of the eggs when they're in that kind of thick patty form. Not my favorite way to eat eggs. The bacon's good. <laughs> I'm surprised I've got any syrup left. My two little granddaughters, those two little tiny things can pack away the pancakes. I am telling you what, it is impressive. It's been a really long time since I had French toast because I don't eat gluten. It was kind of a treat for me. Mmm. Mm-hmm. French toast is good. I've always liked French toast. Mm-hmm. Let's try this fruit compote. I just made mine with raspberries and blueberries, but it can be made with a lot of different kinds of fruit. Alone, it's just like eating jam. In fact, I'll bet you that's what he ordered it for. I mean, maybe not, maybe he just ate it with a spoon, but let's try the toast. Oh yeah, much better. Can you imagine it's your last meal on earth, you're gonna die and you order a bowl of bran flakes? That's a brown flake. I mean, I don't hate them, but your last meal? He had a Coke. Mmm, full sugar soda. And he had a glass of milk. Anyway, quite the breakfast, quite the last meal, right? Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death dining with the damned. Hit the like button if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more from me. It does help. You can also support me by joining my Patreon and there will be some bonus content there as well. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.